was thinking as some of the folk were being so kind towards my life and my ministry that you just have to uh, forgive me as I go back now 35 years to the night that Jesus Christ came into my life. 35 years. I'm getting old now. Hold me up, girl. 35 years. I want to tell you something. The only one that ever deserves praise is him. Amen. For all he's done and all he does and all he does in us. And I can stand here tonight and tell you that after 35 years, he's never failed me. I've failed him time and time again. I've messed up, messed up, missed it. But he is forever faithful. And if we will but enter this walk by faith and trust him, he will take us from point A all the way to point B. My kids sang a song in the church a couple of weeks ago, when we all get to heaven. Yeah. And I can't stop listening to it. Not because I just got to run to get to heaven. I'm going to get there soon enough. But the awesome thought that this journey that we're on tonight will end in that street of gold, in that wonderful place that we can't even fathom. Uh, to steal a line, you're going to like the way you look, I guarantee you, when we get there. Amen. Open your Bibles, please, tonight to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. This passage has been on my mind for several weeks and uh, coming down to our date here. Oh, I'll be here in the morning at 9.30 if you can make it. And I do have some product from the ministry on the back table. Those are my commercials. But coming down and thinking about being here, this passage has been dominating my thinking. I want to take us to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Other good word-for-word -word translations actually give it live by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Live, live by the Spirit. Paul wouldn't have said that, walk, live in the sphere of the Spirit, if that wasn't a potential. He wouldn't have said it if we couldn't do it. He wouldn't have said it if it wasn't available. But it is available. Every single Christian, under the sound of my voice tonight, can operate, as Paul said to in this passage, walk in, live by the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. A lot of different definitions have come down the Christian pike when it comes to the word flesh. But I'd like to just consider it tonight as the fact that we are still human, and there's pieces of us that I won't always try to define that have not yet been refined and are certainly not yet glorified. Right, right. There's poor parts of you in your heart, in your mind, no matter how long you live for Christ, that can give you a little bit of trouble in your Christian experience. And sometimes even take you by surprise. Wow. Amen. Because you thought that you would never think like that thought again. And all of a sudden, there it was. <laughs> flesh we're still human beings right. God knows that he understands that he's given us the process by which we can gain ascendancy or victory over all flesh all fleshly thinking all fleshly acts if you through the spirit there it is again do mortify the deeds of the body, Romans 8, 13, then you shall live. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
So we can. It's available. None of us are at that place where we have eliminated all flesh. We won't ever have that place until the rapture of the church, till you get a glorified body and then boom, that war will forever be over. But until then, the exhortation, the instruction, the encouragement is walk in the spirit. Well, what is that? That'd be a good question to answer, wouldn't it? Because Paul says that if we'll walk in the Spirit, we, and this is a promise, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now let me, let me say this to you before I begin the message, and really I'm, I guess I'm already beginning, but it says that you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. He never said that you won't experience lust of the flesh. Okay, you're too holy. Let me preach over you. He never said that in this frame, in our Christian experience, as a God-fearing Christian loving Jesus, that we would never experience or come face to face with the lust of the flesh. He doesn't promise us the elimination of the desires of the flesh. He doesn't promise us that. He tells us how to deal with what we have to face. So the idea that you'll never have a lust of the flesh is an unrealistic expectation you need to take out of your mind. That's it. That's good. Come on. Amen. Now that doesn't mean you get to let your mind run wild and your desires run wild. We're not teaching and preaching, oh, it doesn't matter. We're teaching it does matter. But there also has to be that sense of encouragement going on in you that says, I know I'm not where I need to be yet, but thank God I'm not what I was. And even though I still can experience those things that are within and without that motivate me or move me and, I, and I'm trying to gain the victory over it. Uh, I, I, I recognize that I still will face it. I, but this one thing I do. Yes. I don't lie down and just say, okay, I give up. Right, right. I don't quit and walk away. Yeah. Come on. I don't say it's too hard. Right. I, I don't say I don't know how, even when we don't know how. Because your answer is always found in the Word of God. I guarantee you, if I don't have the answer, if Pastor Matt doesn't have the answer, the Word of God has the answer. Get in it and find it and, and embrace it. It's there. Because Paul said, if we walk in the Spirit, we shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh that we face right now in this present condition in which we live. For the flesh, lusts is opposed to the things of the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. I love that verse simply because it tells me that you as a born-again believer want to do the right thing, but this battle with flesh and spirit sometimes causes you to do the wrong thing. But in your heart... Okay, when I was lost as a goose, I didn't care what I did. I bragged about the things that I did that were awful. I can't even tell you right. what my life was like. But I used to brag about it. Now I'm ashamed of it. Why? Because when I met Jesus, the regenerative power of the Holy Spirit so transformed my heart that I began to hate what I used to love and love what I used to hate. And so I want you to know in the midst of your battle, in the midst of your struggle, in the midst of all this that's going on, the very core of your heart as a believer is you want to do the right thing. And this battle of flesh and spirit is sometimes, not always, on occasion, not every day, every now and then, not all the time, 
is stopping you from doing, listen, what you really want to do is serve God. God. Amen. 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 No excuses. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. And I just want to minister for a few minutes. Life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of your Spirit, which we have felt, for the gifts in operation that we have sensed, for the love that you're displaying to the body of Christ tonight that is gathered here. Anoint me, Lord, to teach your word, to proclaim your word, to preach your word in a way that the people can grasp it. Give them an anointing to hear. Let them see, Father, with their inner man, let revelation and insight come and let them walk in victory all the days of their life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 The battle in Galatians is a battle between law and grace, between faith and grace, between works and faith. I won't go into the whole story, but I have to lay it out at least a little bit in order for you to walk through this path with me tonight. Paul had laid the foundation in churches in the Galatian region. It wasn't just one church, it was multiple churches. And he had gone on the first missionary journey with Barnabas and preached the gospel. And man, lives were changed. I mean, God came through. Paul faced some rough days. It's not always easy living for the Lord. He got stoned and left for dead on his first missionary journey. Not exactly the great start you want to write home about. Dear Mom, I got stoned and left for dead on my first missionary journey. But God saw fit, if he ever did, if he did actually die, and some think he might have, to raise him from the dead, and he went back into town and kept preaching. You can't keep a God man down. Amen. And awesome things happened. Lives were changed. When you preach the simple gospel, this thing isn't complicated. We make it complicated. The gospel is the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth to pay the price for your sin and mine. Living Perfectly for 33 and a half years, he laid down his life as penalty, as penalty for my sin. And not just for mine, but for the sin of the whole world. Everybody that has ever lived, all their sin has already been paid for by Jesus Christ. Every brother who hasn't accepted the Lord, every mother, every cousin, every person that you walk by at work every day, their sins are already paid. And it's our job to tell them. It's done. It's covered. It's finished. Simply accept Jesus as your Savior and you can have the joy of a new life in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. Simply accept Jesus as the Lord and you'll have not just eternal life, life forever with God, but abundant life. That's the good news. Paul preached it. And person after person after person grabbed a hold of the simplicity of the gospel who said, and the gospel Paul taught, taught was just, put your faith in Jesus. He'll bring you through. Raised from the dead is validation that all sins were paid for. But he didn't just pay the penalty for our sin. He broke the power of sin's grip in the human heart for all who will believe. Amen. Now let me say that again. Not just the penalty was paid. Not just your debt. But the power that can and did grip us and hold us in dominion and move us in a route, in a way of thinking and doing that was totally contrary to God. The nature of sin indwelling in us dominated 
But when Jesus died on Calvary, he broke the back of that indwelling sin. He broke the power of sin. He didn't just pay the penalty for sin. He broke the power for sin. And that's part of our salvation too. But the people in the Galatian region, after they were saved, began to hear another gospel. And that gospel said, well, it's good that you've accepted Jesus, but now, and in their case, they added the Mosaic law, but now you need to become a Jew. You need to follow the Mosaic law, keep the Sabbath days, be circumcised, keep the feast days, basically become a Jew. It's good that you accepted Jesus. We were glad about that, but now... Bless this earpiece, Lord. <laughs> but now... You gotta do, you gotta do, you gotta do. Now here's the problem with the Christian church. Instead of teaching ourselves that the most important thing for us to learn is faith in Christ and the value of what the cross accomplished for us, yes. we teach people what to do. Right. Now doing is right. 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 Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 Okay, over here. Doing good is right. Yeah. Amen. Doing good is really right for this group over here, especially. <laughs> so doing good is right, but God never accepted us or works in us because we do good. Yeah. To fall into that mindset means that I not only have to do good, I have to keep doing better because the conflict in me must be there because I'm not doing enough. Wow. And before you know it, all we're interested in is doing more, more, more. The message in tongues interpretation tonight coming to me, all you that are heavy laden, that are burdened. We burden ourselves with the to-do of Christianity, thinking that if I don't do it enough and I don't do it well and I don't do it just the way God said, that he won't even like me. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Yeah. Romans chapter 5 tells us much more now. Right. Being saved by his blood, we shall be saved by his life. Yeah. He didn't just die for you. He died so that he could live in you and supply yeah. you with his strength and his life yeah. Yeah. as you walk through this change that you're going through. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Penalties paid. But they called them Judaizers, and Judaizers they were. And so the whole book of Galatians is Paul saying, let's take you back to what I taught you, and let's forget about what the other guys are teaching you. I hate to say this, but there's a lot of Christian teaching that should just be left alone. Yes, right. If it doesn't teach you faith in Christ, and the value of his death on Calvary, leave it alone. Yes. As a means of righteousness, as a means of living for God, if you're not taught who Christ is and what Christ did for you, and if you're not taught to concentrate on the value of the cross and the result of your faith in him, Hallelujah. Yes. then leave it alone. Amen. The doing part of Christianity comes most naturally when you become something. Yes. Yeah. And you're not a human doing, you're a human being. Yeah. 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 You've got to become something before you do something. Right. Yeah. So I want to become what I need to become in here, and then externally I'll display it. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty of Christianity. I don't do, 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 do and hope that it changes me inside. No amount of <laughs> do, do can change you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's a do, do message. I'll have to do it later. So no amount of work can make you something. Only Jesus can make us something. And Jesus came to you the first time. When you said, I can't save myself. Yes. Lord, I can't. 
you can yes. help. Yes. And that's the message of the cross. Yes. Lord, I can't. You can. Help. And Paul taught this basically to the believers. And he taught them that when they trusted in Christ alone and what he did, and not in the law, not in Mosaic law, not in Christian works or Christian doing or Christian tradition, that the Spirit of God would come into play. Now, we don't understand this like we ought to, and I'll try without taking a thousand years to explain it. The, the value of the cross includes the coming of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Now, wait a minute. If you're Pentecostal, you're going to start speaking in tongues, and I am Pentecostal, so I get it. But let's push back a minute. The coming of the Holy Spirit did two things brand new on the day of Pentecost, not one. He entered to start giving the benefits to the new, newly born church right. that Christ died for on Calvary to provide. The Holy Spirit came as the overseer of the benefits of what Jesus did at Calvary. He came to distribute the benefits as to what now became available to humanity because of what Jesus did at Calvary. So at Pentecost, and don't throw dirt in the air and rip your clothes, and, but at Pentecost, it was the coming of the Spirit, not just the baptism with the Holy Spirit. In the New Covenant, men could be regenerated, baptized into Christ, crucified with Him, buried with Him, raised up with Him to live in Him with a source of power living in them, the Holy Ghost living in them. And every born-again believer from the day of Pentecost forward could be regenerated and have that. Old Covenant people didn't have that. Right. They couldn't because the Holy Spirit couldn't do the work that was anything but temporary in them previous to Calvary because of the problem with sin. Even men and women like David and Moses and Isaiah, when they died, they couldn't go to heaven. That's right. Right. They went to paradise until Hallelujah. sins were taken away. Behold the Lamb that takes away. Hallelujah. So on the day of Pentecost, all the benefits that Jesus died to provide for us became available. And the first one is the internal change, the ability to be known as a new creation in Christ Jesus and have the Holy Spirit living in you. And I don't have time to teach all this. It only takes about a semester, I think, to get through it. <laughs> but here's what you should know. The Holy Spirit lives in every born-again believer, and the thing that activates the Spirit that lives in you is your simple faith in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Not what you do. Yes. When men were under the law, they did not have freedom from the sin nature. Their sin nature was still extremely active. Oh, they were saved, but not with the benefits that you have. They were saved, but all they had to fight sin and uh, and will was willpower, because the internal work of the Holy Spirit was not available. So, because man didn't have the capability to fight sin, God gave the law to protect them. The Bible says that the law that we that were under the law were kept until Christ came. Now, kept is an interesting word because it means that, that, that you were protected. The law was our schoolmaster uh, to, lead, to lead us to Christ. Well, okay, the schoolmaster thing. We, we, Western mindset. We get the little mom with the bun on her head, put the apple on the desk, school mom. Yeah. No, that's not it at all. When Paul refers to a schoolmaster, He's really, he's talking about an old curmudgeon of a soldier that was hired at the end of his career in a Roman family to protect a young boy 
from the roaming hordes of homosexuals that would take young boys on the streets of Rome and rape them and make them slaves. So the schoolmaster was this old yeah. gruff sergeant from the Roman army that was hired to protect the youth of the Roman family. Oh, wow. The law was our schoolmaster. It kept us. It protected us from what? Well, number one, from ourselves and sin taking crazy thoughts and going overboard with us. Ten Commandments, God's emergency break. At least don't go here. Ash, don't kill anybody. Ash, don't hate anybody. But it created a barrier that sometimes aided in the willpower of man enough to stop them from doing some laws will stop some people. Yes. So law kept, not only did the laws keep the people that were in covenant with God safe, they lived in the sphere of the law, and they were kept by the law, they were protected from themselves by the law, and they were protected from the outer world, because the law forbid interaction with food, and peoples that were violently opposed to God. So God made the law so that you just didn't. Right. And it was like a fence. We were kept under right. the law. Right. Yeah. Protected by the law. Separated by the law. Because inside of us we weren't changed but we wanted to live for God. Yeah. And so the law was a necessary part of God's revelation. Right. Do this. Don't do that. That's what we tell our kids when they're five years old. You never, ever, cross the road. <laughs> ever. <laughs> ever. Yeah. Yeah. Law. <laughs> Curmudge. Soldier. Why? Because we don't want them to get hit. We're trying to keep them. Right. right? Amen. But the law and the Christian doings can't change the inward portion of the heart. That's what the old covenant people could never have. Right. Even when Jesus was here on the earth before Calvary, they couldn't they couldn't have that because it hadn't been paid for and it hadn't been distributed yet. Right. right. That's good. But you and I tonight are no longer kept Hallelujah. by the law. Hallelujah. Listen, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, we are kept, same word, we are kept by faith through the power of God. What does that mean? That means that we don't need a list of rules and regulations to keep us. The indwelling presence of the Spirit is now available to keep us. Right. And he doesn't just stop us from going someplace and doing the wrong thing. Right. He has the capability yes. of changing yes. what we want yes. and taking out of us the wrong desires and planting in us the right desires. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, he came first of all, Acts 2, 1 through 3, for the very first time, and began to initiate the benefits. And then in Acts 2 and 4, he gave us power for service and power for gifts, the same thing that we felt and since tonight. Can you just give me the handheld? Yeah. I, I don't have any tape, but it's a great microphone, and I love them. Okay. We're doing the Hallelujah two-step. Right. So, what you have tonight is not a law and a list of do's and don'ts that are trying to keep you from going somewhere you shouldn't go and doing something you shouldn't do and being somewhere you shouldn't be. You have within you now, the, because of the value of Calvary, because of what Calvary did, yeah. you have within you God himself. Yeah. Not just what God said. You have God himself. We're no longer kept by the law. 
We're kept by the Spirit. Yes. We're kept by faith through the power of God. And the power of God today in us, ladies and gentlemen, that are born again, is the Spirit. Right. If you're a born again believer, the Spirit of God lives in you. Yes. And the same Spirit, listen, and the same Spirit, listen, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. For you, right. or the Spirit can do the work for you. It doesn't mean that we don't do right things, don't do godly things, don't do good things. It means that my Christian experience, if it's going to have a value to it, and it's going to really have all the benefits that Jesus died to provide for me, means that I need to live, walk by the sphere, in the sphere of where the Spirit is working. And you can. Well, how do we do that, Brother Larson? We do that by living by faith. Now, when we say that, I already see the Christian eyes start to roll. <laughs> well, you're just saying we don't do anything. No, I'm saying that your battle is a fight to believe that all the things I've said from my beginning point tonight to right now that it's true that that's the way that God works yes. that's your fight yes. your fight is not to do your fight is to believe fight the good fight of faith and when we fight the good fight of faith we will be living in walking in ordering our lives within the sphere of the spirit where we can be kept by the power of God through faith yes. Yes. That's good. So when the Galatians all heard, no, go back to laws and works and dues and the old covenant, the old covenant couldn't change you. All it could do was protect you. Yes. It was righteous and holy and good, but it couldn't change you. Right. But what Jesus did at Calvary allows you to be changed from the inside out. But you have to believe that this is the process that you've entered into. That's right. Walk by the Spirit. Walk in the realm of the Spirit. Live your life with this thought. So my first thought in the morning is not what do I need to do to earn God's approval. It's thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Thank you, Jesus, for making this new creation life available. I am a new creation in Christ. And I know it. That's how we walk in the sphere of the Spirit. That's how we order our life. Fighting the fight of faith. To believe that. And believing that as I keep my eyes on Christ. And I don't try to help God out. Come on. Way to go, Abraham. Little Hagar on the side, please. We don't try to help God out. Does everybody know what I just said? Yes. The story of Hagar. I don't have to go through the whole thing, right? Little Hagar on the other side. Okay. But we do that. God's not quite big enough to handle who I am, and so he needs me. Well, you're the problem in the first place. I'm the problem in the first place. How can I fix me? God, you need my help? Let me do something to show you how this is done. What are we thinking? And yet that's what we tend to point ourselves towards. What we do. Now I know that God left us in a condition that's far from completion. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is our earnest. He is our, the down payment of what we're heading for. Yes. yes. Right? He's the just the earnest, the initial payment, the first little bit. And if this little bit 
gets much better. Amen. Okay, um, it's going to get better. Because <laughs> I have just a little bit, it's going to get better. Yes. Amen, brother I say it's going to get better. How good will it be when that moment comes when the battle is over? But the battle is here. So let's talk about the battle. Let's not pretend that it's not there. Let's not pretend that we don't have wrong desires and wrong thoughts. Let's not try to put on the mask of Christ and look holy when inwardly we don't understand why we're fighting the battles that we fight. Let me tell you what it is. You're a human being. Yes. You and I were jerks on the inside. Yes. <laughs> Religion doesn't like that, but that's honest. You do stuff that even you don't understand. You think stuff that... Well, how do you know, Brother Lars? Well, I read about it. <laughs> because I are one, just like you. So I live my life with my faith in Christ and the cross, and as I do, I still encounter lusts of the flesh. Well, what are yours, Brother Lars? You take none of your business. <laughs> Here comes the line. Lust of the flesh, you're like a buffet line. Eat off your own plate. That's right. yeah. yeah, especially now, right? That's right. <laughs> so I've seen Christians quit because they don't understand why things surface, why things are there. Because they're changed. They don't want them there. The lusts of the flesh, remember, come to take us out of what we really want to be and what we really want to do. Right. Because what we really what we really did when we got up this morning was say, Lord, I love you and I want to serve you. That's my heart because I'm a born-again new creation creature. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this other side of me, there's something around me. And we can blame it on them and him and it, but it's me. Right. Right. Yeah. And it can be an outside source, but it's still affected me. Yes. It's how I respond to it. She said that about me. He said this to me. They did that to me. <laughs> the human element, flesh, the part of us that has not yet been transferred to eternity with Christ, troubles us all. So the worst thing you could do is say, I'm unusual. <laughs> I, I, I just don't get it. I must not have a revelation of the cross because if I really was walking in the Spirit, then I would no longer have lusts of the flesh. It's not what the Bible said. It said the Spirit of God within you can come to your rescue, keep you from fulfilling, carrying out, acting upon the lusts that you have. Now, I like it when God takes the desire out. Amen. And I do believe he'll take it out. I've seen alcohol go, cocaine go, lust go, Copenhagen go, cigarettes go. He's still working on anger and jealousy and malice and in other people I know. Um, in me. 35 years of living for God and I can still see things that need to be changed. Amen. I'm probably really messing up your camera. But I can still, listen to me, Pastor Larson is saying, I still see things in me that I don't handle right. right. And I've been doing this 35 years. I've been preaching the message of the cross since 1996. Wow. A few days. <laughs> so knowing the process doesn't get you, give you a get out of the process free card. That's right. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Knowing the process puts you in the center of the process 
And here's what God does. He begins to exhibit to us the things he wants removed from us, which means that he's going to stir up a situation where the things that he wants to get out of you are rising to the top and exposed. And when you don't understand what he's doing, you look at yourself and go, oh, I must not get it. I must not be saved. No, you're getting those things to the surface because you know what to do with them now when they come. But don't lose sight of it because you didn't think that was in you. How could you be that way? How could you think like How could you do that act? And we beat ourselves up and we fail to operate in the sphere of faith, which is what we have to do in order to walk in the sphere of the Spirit and have Him labor and work within us. So when God exposes you to you, and thank God He always does it like the guy behind the curtain in The Wizard of Oz, right? No one sees, who's that man behind the curtain? That's you! <laughs> He does it where no one sees it yeah, but you. Good. Thank goodness that you don't get to come into my curtain. I don't want to come into yours. But God is there. God is with you behind the curtain. God knows what you need to be changed. And he allows the circumstances of our life that sometimes time to be seen so unfair and so devastating to root out of us that element of flesh, that ungodly part of us that still hasn't yet been subjected to the processes of faith and grace and the power of the Spirit. He wants it out before you get home. And when we see it, we sometimes think, oh, I don't understand. We get confused. Here we are defeated again. We're going there again. We said we'd never do it. Ten minutes later, we're at it again. We repented and really meant it, and we asked God to forgive us, and he did. And then for the 937th time that week, If you think for one minute that I'm condoning failure 937 times a week, I'm not. I'm trying to impress upon you the battle that you really are in is if it did occur 937 times, you would know where to go to resolve it. Amen. To the sphere of the spirit. Here's the sphere of the law. It can't change you. That's right. it, could, it could protect a little but I need to be kept by the power of God through faith. Yeah. 1 Peter 1, 5 through 7, kept by the power of God through faith. So now, as I experience the lust of the flesh, I say, Jesus, I see it. I see the part of me that needs to die, that needs to be defeated, that part of me that wants to excel and jump up and elevate myself, the pride, the arrogance, the anger, the malice. Man, we use a lot of excuses to stay the way we are. Brother Swigert tells a story when he was younger as a preacher. He said he has a, had a terrible temper. And a man, he was working on a house right next to where they lived. And he got onto Donnie when he was little. Well, Donnie's still kind of, no, I'm, he, <laughs> he's little. But I mean, little, you know, five, six. And Brother Swigert saw it. And he was working on his house. And he had a hammer in his hand. And he said, before I knew it, I was next door because that guy had threatened your kid, and I had a hammer under his nose. <laughs> Holy Ghost, preacher of the gospel. <laughs> hammer under it, and, and, and he left, and he thought, how, what, what, huh? <laughs> and then he started making excuses. He said, yeah, well, my grandfather had a temper, and my mom had a temper, and my dad had a temper, and I guess I, I, just, I just have it too. I just have to live with it. And the Holy Spirit spoke up and said to him, well, I thought God was your father. So God is your father now. Hallelujah. Yes. Your relations with others can't stand in the light of that truth. Yes. So we ought to be like our father in yes. heaven. Amen. No excuses. 
We don't have to have them. The love of Christ covers you. The blood of Christ covers you. Justification maintains you when your faith is in Christ as all these changes take place. You never accept the wrong, but you need to understand that you're working through the process of eliminating them. And you have to face them to eliminate them. Mm -hmm. Walk in the Spirit. Keep your faith in Christ. Recognize the things that need to change. Submit it to the Lord. I, I recognized something a few weeks ago. I won't go into the details of it. But I began to pray. Lord, you need to change my heart. You need to change my heart about this. I, I didn't even see it. Just, you need to change it. And you know, he has started. So the prayer of faith is still, I can't, you can help. And I'm seeing the change. You know how the change, you recognize it, you get into that situation and all the things, the things that bothered you, they don't. And the things that tempted you, they don't. Because God is changing. Amen. But if we want to live free from the powers of flesh, the part of us that is still human, we must be led by the Spirit. Yes, Lord. And the Spirit will always take you to Calvary and say, keep your faith in Him, who He is and what He's done. The Spirit will never lead you to loss. He'll lead you to the finished work of Christ. And then your, faith, then your fight becomes a fight of faith. Some things disappear simply, quickly, easily. Other things may take months, even years. Don't give in. Don't give out. Don't quit. Walk back the next day to the sphere of the Spirit. Say, Lord, I'm here. I'm believing. And I'm ready to be changed. Amen. And His Spirit will do what Christ paid the price for Him to do. Howbeit to us, it may seem slow. But how long is eternity anyway? As long as God gets the work done, because you have allowed Him to do it through faith and grace. Walk in the Spirit. Life in the sphere of the Spirit. Naya, would you come?